Okay, in this video I'm going through the 26 study guide questions for the electricity, magnetism, physical science test. So, uh, question number one. What is the fundamental source of magnetism? Well, the answer to that is the spinning of electrons. And more specifically, it's, it's when a large number of unpaired electrons all spin in the same direction. That's why certain elements make better magnets than others. Elements like cobalt, um, iron, and nickel happen to have a lot of unpaired electrons that are able to spin in the same direction. Uh, question number two, what is a magnetic field? Well, magnetic field is just the area around a magnet where magnetic influence is felt or sensed. Um, question number three, sketch the field around a bar magnet and around the Earth. So let me start with the bar magnet. We've done this before. So the basic idea is like this. We saw this when you dropped iron filings on it and made that same sort of pattern uh, for the Earth. And of course, we're going to tilt Earth on a 23 degree uh, axis there, 23.5. So here's my Earth, my North Pole, South Pole, uh, and it makes the same kind of pattern like that. Okay, that was question three. Question four, what is electromagnetic induction? Uh, electromagnetic induction is uh, when you create electricity by moving a magnet relative to a coil of wire. Uh, induction means like to create something, so electromagnetic means to induce electricity using a magnet. So again, the basic idea is you have a coil of wire, Say that's hooked up to like a light bulb. Or I'll use my uh, schematic drawing there. And you take a magnet and you can move the magnet through the coil, or you could move the coil through the magnet or around the magnet, or you could spin the coil. All you need is relative movement. So when this moves relative to that, you generate electricity. And if you want to think about what fundamentally causes that, electrons flowing through the wire, that's electricity. Electrons have a negative charge. So when I move a magnet somewhere near there, all the electrons just kind of get subbed. And when electrons get subbed, they're technically moving, and that's electricity. So if you can find a way to constantly keep that magnet moving, you're going to constantly be shoving those electrons and creating electricity. Number five, will you describe or sketch how the following power plants generate electricity? Uh, well, start with hydroelectric. And again, the basic idea is if you can move that magnet relative to that coil, you can create electricity. So imagine we have some sort of system where either the magnet moves on a wheel or more realistically, the wheel is hooked up to the coil so that when the wheel turns, the coil spins. And then you just have water that's going to spin that wheel like that. So you put it inside a dam or under a waterfall, something like that. Um, wind. Wind power. Well, it's the same thing, same setup, but instead of the water turning that wheel, which moves the magnet coil system, now it's just the wind that does it. And generally, in a wind turbine, what you see is blades like that, and inside the turbine or inside the wind tower, we have a coil. And believe it's some sort of stationary magnet and when this wind turbine spins the blades it causes the coil to spin and again all you need is relative movement one needs to move relative to the other and you generate electricity which will go out like that uh, and finally nuclear uh, natural gas and nuclear well the idea behind this these all categorize as what we call thermal um, things like nuclear oil coal natural gas, trash. I used to say wood, but no real power plant uses wood. It's just too inefficient. Um, again, these all sort of categorize as thermal. And what we mean by that is it's rigged up to some kind of system where you have a coil, and you have a magnet, and there's some kind of wheel. Now again, it probably doesn't look just like this, where the wheel turns the magnet. More realistically, when the, the wheel spins, the coil is going to spin, but all you need is relative movement. And then you have some kind of water flowing through here. 
and you basically put things underneath the water to heat it up. So you can put oil, coal, natural gas, or trash and burn it and just keep stocking that fire. Or you could just put nuclear rods, or uranium rods in there, and those naturally give off so much heat that it boils that water as well. And the idea is the heat goes into the water, the water turns to steam, convection of course carries the steam up, and it spins the wheel, and that's how you generate your power. Number six says, what is voltage? Well, uh, the true definition of voltage is it's an electric, it, it's a, difference in electrical potential between two points in a circuit. What that really means is it's like a positive force on one end of the circuit and a negative force on the other. And that's what gives electrons a reason to move in one direction. Without a voltage, they're just moving around randomly. But all of a sudden, if I apply a big positive over here and a big negative over here, the electrons are going to want to go from the negative to the positive. And the larger voltage is like I make these even larger. So now they're going to want to move even faster from negative to positive. What is the unit for voltage? That would be your volt. What is current? Current, which is of course I. Current is a measure of how much electricity is actually flowing. What's the actual flow rate of electrons through the circuit. So how much electricity is actually being generated is your current. What is the unit for that? Well, that would be amperes. A, commonly known as amps. What is resistance, which is R? Well, resistance is just how much the circuit or the wire resists the flow of electricity. Or in other words, how much it slows down the current. Uh, the more resistance, the um, less electricity you're going to get flowing. And just the example I used with this was if I took um, this battery and I had a wire going from one end to the other, the current would definitely flow because, bat because the wires have very low resistance. Whereas if I do it with my two fingers, no electricity is flowing, or at least no measurable electricity, because my human flesh offers quite a lot of resistance to the flow of electricity. Okay. Next question, the unit for resistance, that would be the ohm, or plural is ohms, and the symbol for that is omega. 12, how are voltage, resistance, and current related? In other words, what's the formula and what's this called? Well, it's Ohm's law. And there's several, three ways of representing it. You could just put either one, either element alone. Um, Commonly, it's called V equals IR, which means voltage equals current times resistance. I prefer to write it as current equals voltage over resistance. The third way, obviously, you can put R by itself. R is going to equal V over I. Just double check. Yes. Okay. Three ways to write it. I like this one the best because it makes sense in my head. You want to measure how much current you're going to get? Well, the more voltage, the more current. The more resistance, the less current. All right. Um, 13, let's get into the math. What is the voltage of a circuit that has 10 ohms of resistance? Resistance equals 10 ohms and has a 2 amp current flowing through it. Current is I equals 2 amps. Voltage equals question mark. Well, our formula, V equals IR. V equals 2 amps times 10 ohms. Unfortunately, in this case, the units don't like cancel or form a, a set unit. Uh, nothing really cancels in this case. But 2 times 10 is going to give me 20, and the unit for that is volts. 20 volts of current. Number 13. What is the voltage of a circuit that has 10 ohms of resistance? Uh, 13 I just did, sorry. 14. Two 9-volt batteries are hooked up together in a circuit with one bulb. So if two 9-volts are hooked up together, that means the total voltage is 18 volts. Again, if you have two batteries hooked up like this, it's like a double battery. Or even if you have like this and like this, 
and you have a strategically placed wire going like that, you've doubled up your battery. So 9 volts, 9 volts means 18. Voltage equals 18 volts. The bulb offers 10 ohms of resistance. 10 ohms. How much current is flowing through the wire? Well, this is my favorite way to express Ohm's law. Current equals volts over resistance, which equals 18 volts over 10 ohms. And what's that going to be? 1.8, something like that. Let me try it without a calculator. So that's going to be 9 fifths. Uh, 1.75, let me just get a cut, 1.8 I think. Yeah, 1.8. 1 1.8 1 and the unit for current is amps. Number 15, I should be rewriting the numbers up here. 15, the human body when dry has about 10,000 ohms of resistance. Resistance equal 10,000, 100,000. 100,000 ohms. It has been measured that 0 0.2 amps of current flowing through a human is enough to be fatal. Current equals 0 0.2 amps. What is the maximum voltage that a human could theoretically sustain before this threshold is reached? So voltage equals question mark. Well, V equals IR. V equals 0 0.2 amps times 100,000 volts, uh, sorry, ohms. So 0 0.2 times 100,000, that means uh, 20,000 volts. 20,000 volts, assuming you're dry. Number 16. When the human body is wet and the skin broken, like you have a cut or something, uh, resistance drops to as low as 500 ohms. That's like 200 times less resistance. Not good. Resistance equals uh, 500 ohms. In this condition, can the voltage from a simple kitchen appliance, 110 volts, be fatal? Solve for the current and compare it to the fatal threshold of 0 0.2 amps from the previous question. So, current equals volts over resistance equals 110 divided by 500 or 11 over 50. Let's work out the math. Zero point two two amps. So the previous question said zero point two amps could be fatal. Therefore, this is more. So yes, if you are wet and you have a cut on your hand, a simple kitchen appliance could kill you. Now I'm not trying to scare monger. The only way that's going to happen is if you take a wire cutter and thread the wires of your toaster or something like that. Um, just goes to show the electricity is not something to be playing around with. Uh, Seventeen. What in a circuit does a battery supply? The answer is voltage. A lot of people think that the battery supplies the current. Well, it enables the current to flow by providing the voltage. It provides the difference in potential energy. Remember, that's the whole reason the battery has a, a positive side and a negative side, is that the electrons want to go from here to here, but they can't cut through the middle, so they have to go around. How does a battery work? I just sort of did it very simply. Um, let me just reiterate it. A battery has a positive and a negative end. Now, that's due to a chemical reaction, which you don't need to know the details of. Uh, different batteries have different types of chemical reactions. But the, the chemical reaction causes a positive charge on one end and a negative charge on the other. And there's a, some sort of barrier in the middle that electrons are unable to pass through. So electrons want to go this way, but they can't. So they look for some way to go around. Now, if you just have a battery hanging out on your 
desk, technically, electrons are trying to go through the air around like that, but they can't do that. So they wait until they get something that can conduct them, a good conductor. So right now, again, they're trying to go there by way of my fingers. Or in this way, they're trying to go there through my torso and my heart. But fortunately, I put up a lot of resistance to that. But if I hooked up a wire, it would, in fact, go through. And that was number 18. Number 19. Uh, sketch and label all parts of a light bulb. All right. I should have been specific and called it an incandescent light bulb, which are on the way out. So this question might not be appropriate if you're watching this in the future. Here's a light bulb. There are two contact points anywhere on this side and anywhere on this bottom. So let's me, let me draw two wires like that. And the basic idea is electricity is going to flow into the battery from one of these two contact points. Let's just assume it starts in here and it's going to flow up this wire and around the filament and back down and out. Okay, so whether it's going to the left or the right, that's a path of electrons. Now, you need something to actually produce the light. So what happens is we have something here called the filament. Now, filament is a piece of metal. It's generally made out of tungsten that is a conductor of electricity, but not a very good one. In other words, it puts up a lot of resistance. So therefore, electricity is able to make it through, but not very easily. In fighting the resistance of this filament, the, uh, the electricity, the wire, gives off a lot of heat and a lot of light. A lot of heat and a lot of light. It's almost like, uh, you know, if you had to get through um, a hallway and like a football team was in the hallway trying to stop you from getting through but you were determined you could bump and push and shove your way eventually through the football team they would put up a lot of resistance but if you make it through to the other side you would be all kind of hot and sweaty and you'd be bumping off everyone you'd give off a lot of heat and uh, if you were an electron you'd give off a lot of light anyway that's the filament it's made out of a very high melting point material like tungsten one of the highest metal melting points because it gives off so much heat that it can get up to 2,500 or 3,000 degrees Celsius. If you use a piece of steel or a piece of copper, it will have melted. And if that melts and falls off, obviously the circuit's done. Now that leads us to why the bulb exists. Well, if that tungsten's burning at 2,500 or 3,000 degrees, it's going to react with the air around it. Now, if you heat anything up to 3,000 or 2,500, oxygen in the air, nitrogen in the air, are going to react with it. So what they do is they put this bulb around it and they pump all the regular air out and they pump in an inert gas or in other words a gas that does not react with anything and if we look at the periodic table it's going to be anything on the right column. Now the most economical one that makes the most sense is argon. So for example they'll have argon gas inside the bulb which even if it's 2,500 or 3,000 degrees, argon's still not going to react with it because argon has eight valence electrons. It's full. It's done. It's a noble gas. Okay? Now, if the bulb breaks, all of a sudden you have all this oxygen rushing inside, and that oxygen is going to react with this, cause it to form some kind of tungsten oxide compound, and tungsten oxide is not going to conduct electricity as well, or it could melt or something's going to happen, and that pretty much happens instantly. So if the bulb breaks, light bulb's not going to work. Uh, number 20. Sketch a series circuit with one battery and two bulbs. You may use lifelike or schematic symbols. Uh, let me do both quickly. One battery. I've drawn better bulbs in my day. Okay, two bulbs. Series circuit, you give electrons one path to follow. Let me even draw my filaments in here. One path. From here into the bulb. Technically, it's going through the filament. Out the bulb. Into the bulb. Out the bulb. 
One path to follow. No choices. Uh, number 21. If the series circuit above is powered by a 9-volt battery, how much voltage is each bulb receiving? Well, in a series circuit, the voltage has to be shared among all the devices or all the loads. So if it's two bulbs sharing 9 volts, this one's receiving 4.5 volts, this one's receiving 4.5 volts, and that's why for every one you add, they all get dimmer. Okay? Uh, let me just quickly draw what this looks like in schematic form. So it's a lot quicker. There's my battery. There's one bulb. There's a second bulb. And we're done. I'll just put my bulbs around just like that. Same thing. All right. Number 22. Parallel circuit with one battery and two bulbs. Now this one I prefer to draw the bulbs sideways. It makes it a little easier for me, so I'm going to do that. draw my wires. Now with this, I, I want to make like hubs, which are the choices electrons can follow. That's the key. In parallel, electrons have a choice. Now, look, obviously electrons don't have a mind of their own. They don't think, but you give them options. Two different paths to take. So let's go with this path to get to the second bulb, and then from there, this path to go to the first one. So again, electrons don't think, they don't have a mind of their own, but when the electrons get to this place, they have two options. And really what happens is, if there are too many electrons here, they're going to flow that way. And if there are too many here, they're going to flow that way. And eventually they reach like an equilibrium where they all get supplied. Okay, now 23. Well, let me draw it in schematic very quick. Again, here's my uh, battery. Let's let me draw it the other way. There's one bulb. There's a second bulb. So it's quicker to draw in schematic if you know these terms. Uh, 23, in a parallel circuit above, if this is a 9-volt battery, how much voltage is each bulb receiving? you got to just know that they don't have to split it up. They will each draw that voltage out of the battery. So this is receiving 9 volts of voltage. This is also receiving 9 volts of voltage. Therefore, they're both going to be equally bright. You could hook up 100 bulbs in parallel, and they would each pull 9 volts out of that battery. What does that mean for the battery? It just means it drains 100 times faster. Okay, 24. What is a motor? A motor, simply put, it's a device which converts electrical energy or electricity into mechanical energy or some kind of physical movement. Okay, so again, electricity. Uh oh. We're losing it. Color change. Electricity to movement is a motor. 25. What is a generator? It's just the opposite. A generator is something that takes movement and converts it to electricity. How does it do that? Faraday's law, electromagnetic induction. It's something we talked about earlier on in the slides. Coil, magnet, magnet relative movement. So a generator is movement to electricity. Or sometimes it's referred to in terms of energy. So you would say mechanical energy into electrical energy. The idea here is that a motor and a generator can basically flip-flop. And finally, 26, what is an electromagnet? Electromagnet is a magnet that is only magnetic when a current is flowing through it. So if there's no electricity, uh, the current stops. And if I had my little globe set up, I would show, but I, I've since dismantled it because I realized that by having it on, uh, it's constantly pulling electricity out, uh, you know, t costing your parents tax dollars. So I made sure to unplug it when I'm not demoing it. A um, couple examples of real-life use. Best example is a junkyard crane. 
Okay, so imagine uh, a giant crane like this. Come on. Usually shaped like that. And there's a big electromagnet here. Okay, so imagine we have like a car that it wants to pick up. Let's see if I can do this. All right, right now the electromagnet is on. Therefore, it is magnetic and it's going to stick to the top of that car. Okay, current is still flowing and this is going to take a lot of energy to keep that going. The current is still flowing, still flowing, still flowing. It gets to where it wants to drop it. They cut the current off. The car drops down. That's an electromagnet. Um, another good use of electromagnets are fire doors. You'll notice around the school there's a lot of doors that are propped up against magnets against the wall. You might think they're just regular magnets, but if you ever look during a fire drill, uh, I don't know if it happens automatically or whether it has to be manually done from somewhere up above um, in the office, but those magnets get cut, the electricity stops, and therefore the doors close. And they close naturally, um, and it's to kind of compartmentalize a fire. Obviously, you could walk through the door, but the doors close, and the fire remains in certain parts of the building. Okay, so that's the review for this test. Make sure you study your notes. Make sure you ask me or any of your other physical science teachers about anything that confuses you. Good luck.